to participate in Professor Spinelli's um, keynote speech, I will tell some things about our dear Ernesto. Professor Spinelli was chair of the Society for Existential Analysis between 1993 and 1999 and is a life member of the society. His writings, lectures and seminars focus on the application of existential phenomenology to the areas of therapy, psychology and executive coaching. He's a fellow of the British Psychological Society as well as an accredited executive coach and coaching supervisor. In, in 1999, Ernesto was awarded a personal chair as professor, uh, a personal chair as professor of psychotherapy, counseling, and counseling psychology. In 2000, he was reci recipient of the British Psychological Society Division of Counseling Psychology Award for outstanding contribution to the profession. And in 2019, Ernesto received the British Psychological Society Award for Distinguished Contribution to Practice. His most recent book, Practicing Existential Therapy, The Relational World, second edition by Sage, has been widely praised as a major contribution to the advancement of existential theory and practice. This is the one that we have translated to Greece and has come out of, I mean, it's here with us. Uh, coming its, uh, um, its presence now, so you can get it in Greek if you want. His previous books include The Interpreted World, An Introduction to Phenomenology Psychology, a Phenomenological Psychology, Demystifying Therapy, Tales of Unknowing, and The Mirror and the Hammer, Challenging Therapeutic Orthodoxies. Living up to the existential dictum that life is absurd, <laughs> Ernesto is also the author of an ongoing series of private eye novels, the third of which, Everything Has a Price, that's a title, was published in 2023. I highly recommend those, they are fantastic. <laughs> Ernesto's love affair with Greece began in 1966 when he went on a tour of many of its archaeological sites with a group of Italian students. As he says, it was with Greece, love at first sight. And since then, he has been returning as often as possible to discover more of this magical country and its people. Thank you, Ernesto, for the magical country and their people. <laughs> so his keynote speech has a title here and now, there and then, space and time in existential therapy. Welcome. Hi, is this working? Yes, good. Uh, first of all, let me apologize to you. I, I don't have any pretty pictures to show you. Um, so if you want to, feel free to close your eyes, feel free to fall asleep, <laughs> what, whatever suits you. All I have is words, some words. And I'll start with some of the most beautiful words in the English language as I see it. And then I'll move on to my own words, which are much more mediocre and then hopefully end with some beautiful words again. So let me offer you some beautiful words. These are from uh, a series of poems by uh, an American British author called T.S. Eliot. And these are from the four quartets. At the still point of the turning world, neither flesh nor fleshless, neither from nor towards. At the still point, there the dance is, but neither arrest nor movement, and do not call it fixity, 
where past and future are gathered. Neither movement from nor towards, neither ascent nor decline, except for the point, the still point, there would be no dance, and there is only the dance. I can only say, there we have been, but I cannot say where, and I cannot say how long, for that is to place it in time. Time present and time past are both perhaps present in time future, and time future contained in time past. If all time is eternally present, all time is unredeemable. What might have been is an abstraction, remaining a perpetual possibility, only in a world of speculation. What might have been and what has been point to one end, which is always present. So my first guru, who was deeply influenced by a man called Gurdjieff, would always say the following, where am I? Here. When am I? Now. If I'm here, can I be there? No, of course not. And if it is now, can it be then? No, of course not. It is always here and now. We are always here and now. Well, yeah, however, there's a problem. The here and now that I consciously accessed, that I am aware of, that I state I am here and now, is gone. It's already there and then. So yes, we exist here and now, but our attempts to access and state and express that experience takes us to there and then. And for me, as I see it, as I understand it, existential therapy presents that as the basic conundrum, the basic tension that we all face. Every model of therapy contains a notion of conflict or, or disturbance. As I understand it, existential therapy's notion of what might, be, what might be called conflict is precisely that, that sense of awareness between the here and now that is my perpetual existence and my accessing of that existence that puts me into a position of there and then. Sartre is very well known for his famous statement about existence preceding essence. He said it in another way, which I think is perhaps more accessible. At one point he said or wrote, I am no thing pretending to be something. I am no thing pretending to be something. And there he captures this dissonance, this tension, this conflict, if you will, between being as process, being in the here and now, and being as substance, being that places us in the there and then, in terms of our awareness in terms of our accessing. We can talk 
about our being as substance. It can be spoken of. It is a process of reflection. Being a substance makes us into something. It allows us to carry out processes of statements of am-ing, I am, you are, that is, and so forth. It's a noun-like, static notion of being. It captures the process of existence. It gives us meaning. It gives us identity. It gives us individuality. It gives us security. It gives us a sense of certainty. It gives us order. But being here and now, being as process, cannot be captured in statements. To make a statement about here and now immediately places it there and then. And yet, we can allude to it. We can, we can point as if we were pointing our fingers to the moon. Our fingers point us to the no-thingness of our existence, to the constant becoming of our existence, to the verb-like rather than noun-like aspect of our being, to the meaninglessness of our being, to the openness of meaning, to the identityless, to the relatedness, to the insecurity, to the uncertainty, to the chaos that is our existence. There is an emptiness in the here and now. There's no ordinary sense of self-consciousness. These are moments of constant becoming, of groundlessness, a little sense of divide between what we ordinarily experience as self versus other. We have moments whereby we get close to this sense of awareness of the here and now. They might be in dramatic moments, such as moments of chaos, disturbance, war, famine, COVID, and so forth. But they might also occur in everyday moments, moments where we are just sitting or engaging in some ongoing activity. And there's a sudden awareness which already takes us out of that, that awareness. Oh, where have I been? How have I been? Who have I been? This experience of being here and now is yearned for by many. Many spend years trying to find ways of experiencing, engaging, being in the here and now. It can be blissful, but it can also be terrifying. It can also be unwanted as in what clinicians might refer to as states of psychosis. Many of my clients talk about their experience of the three years that they, they lived through COVID as full of moments of almost a, a groundless, senseless, timeless sense of being. They felt trapped in time and indeed in space, as we'll see. And in that sense of emptiness, some experienced it as a liberation and some experienced it as the most terrifying of experiences in their lives. A time when time seemed to both stand still and flow too rapidly. 
a time when time merged into a perpetual sense of emptiness. So let me say something about time and the way that we as therapists consider time and work with time. And let me start with a quote from my colleague Betty Cannon. And she writes this, on beginning to project a different future, I come to have a different past. On beginning to project a different future, I come to have a different past. Now, what is she alluding to? What is she telling us? Something I think that's really important. Many therapists, even many existential therapists, in common with their clients, hold to a linearly causal, unidirectional view of the past. And through this view, assume the task of the therapist is to uncover the issues and influences of their client's past upon their current lives, so that the conflicts and concerns that have arisen from or which have been aggravated by the past can at least be partially resolved. Now, this unidirectional, causal view of the past is usually associated with Sigmund Freud as the originator of this view. And, in, and actually, it seems to emerge that Freud's interpretation of the past was actually a much more complex perspective, a much more complex position. Irvin Yalom highlights this alternative perspective and proposes a vastly different reading of Freud's conclusions. According to Yalom, in Freud's lectures on psychoanalytic technique, Freud suggests the following to the trainees. He says this, an analyst who is not successful in helping the patient to recollect the past should nonetheless give the patient a construction of the past as the analyst sees it. This construction will offer the very same therapeutic benefit as would the actual recollection of past material. So Freud is suggesting that the past is much more pliable, much more plastic, much more constructed than we ordinarily like to think. Now, I don't, I wouldn't necessarily agree with Freud's suggestion that as therapists we give our clients some version of the past that makes sense to us. But the key idea here is around the notion of the plasticity of the past, the flexibility of the, pla of the past. That the past is constantly open to reevaluation and recreation. And here is the key point, I think, that the past, the remembered past, is always dependent upon the current experience of the individual who recalls it. The past we recall serves one function, to validate who we are and claim to be today. The past that we remember validates my present sense of being. The remembered past obviously makes up a minute percentage of the totality of the sensory derived events that we have perceived over the course of our lives. 
In addition, it's also evident that what stands out for us as being relevant, meaningful, or significant within any memory of a past event is itself a highly limited and biased selection of all the variables and constituents contained within that remembered event. We are left with this conclusion that the remembered past, even at the level of its content, is a plastic, selective, and hence incomplete interpretation of the totality of our lived experience. In my view, existential phenomenology argues that the remembered past exposes, reflects, and validates currently lived experience. And considered in this way, it is apparent that the remembered past is so relationally tied to the present that it is more accurate to speak of the past as currently lived rather than of the past in and of itself. But there is more complexity. This interrelation of past and present must also take into account the role and impact of the anticipated future. So just as a source of or rationale for a currently lived event is validated by the remembered past, so too is that same currently lived experience shaped and defined by those assumptions, aspirations, goals, purposes, and wishes that are directed towards future possibilities. So in sum, it's far more adequate to see the past as the past that is currently lived and future directed than to conceive of the past as a separate, fixed, and unchanging, event-laden moment in time. As a concrete example of that, consider the following brief vignette. My client, Maureen, comes to see me because she says she is depressed. She hates herself. She hates her life. She hates all that she has done in her life. She hates all that she has been in her life. She says to me, I am a bad person. I can't be otherwise. Over time, we explore Maureen's position. And at some point, Maureen shifts her understanding of herself, alters this stance that she has adopted. And she comes to a position that says, well, maybe I'm usually a bad person, but not always. And sometimes I can be nice and good. And so Maureen has shifted from I'm always bad to mainly most of the time, but some of the time I can be a good person. And at this point, something really surprising but therapeutically very common happens. Maureen begins to remember seemingly forgotten or suppressed past instances of being good and being nice. Why did this happen? There are many explanations available, of course, but my reading of existential phenomenology would suggest that Maureen's newly adopted stance is that stance because it requires validation. It requ so that its truthfulness will hold and comply more adequately with both her current newfound views of herself, but similarly also with Maureen's 
newly constructed or reconstructed views of herself in the future. So Maureen goes on to add, you know what, Ernesto, I'm going to try to be a good person and a nice person more often, even though I know how difficult that is. And now these newly recalled validating events from my remembered, from Maureen's remembered past, not only confirm her current view of herself, they provide her with a new and future directed sense of aspiration. The remembered past provides us with the means to maintain or validate who we claim to be today, not simply in terms of who and how we define ourselves and our lived experiences, but also with regard to what's towards whatever future direction we aspire for our lived experience. Now, one of the things that has struck me from this viewpoint, which is pretty obvious, but all I can give you is obvious conclusions, is that when we think of situations as in people who have been diagnosed with what is usually referred to as clinical depression, one of the common characteristics of those people is their motion of rocking. They spend a great deal of time rocking back and forth, back and forth. And if we think of this rocking process from its temporal implications, what might we find? We find that the rocking might be expressing a constant movement first towards a past that is too painful to engage with, a movement forward that cannot be envisioned, that has no focus, that has no direction. And so it produces this constant, present emptiness, empty of meaning, empty of values, empty of identity, empty of purpose. The present without its connection to its past and to its future is an experience of emptiness, of no thingness. So let me say something about space now. We constantly act our existence in space. We're always moving away or towards or being still in space, both physically and metaphorically. Ludwig Binswanger argued that people's interrelationship with physical space and their environment revealed their fundamental stance or dialogue towards their existence as a whole. Our own experience of varied and often intense moods and feelings depending on space in which we find ourselves, whether it be a building, a particular room, a busy street, an empty beach, and so forth, makes plain how space affects us and our relation to space, in a sense, provides us with a sense of how we are being, who we are being, in what way we're being. How we shape and reshape space can reveal and define a great many of our values, our aspirations, our insecurities, our concerns. An obvious example of the anxieties that space can bring was observed by my colleague Hans Kohn when he argued about disturbances, when he focused on disturbances, which we call agoraphobia or claustrophobia. These are disturbances of unease in our relation 
to experiences of being in space, whether space is too open or space is too enclosed, whether is, there is too much or too little space. And while we exist in space, space is neither static nor separate from us. Its dimensions and shape are not merely physical, but also always imbued with and reflective of our existence concerns as a whole. Although it's infrequently reflected upon directly, this experience is most often noticed through our moods, the embodied stances we adopt and enact in space. And of course, it's also noticed in the way the world impacts upon us in terms of its view of us, depending upon the space we find ourselves in. So let me give you one obvious example. In this world space that we are in, many of you come up to me very nicely asking for a photo or a selfie or for me to autograph a book or whatever. And you treat me as someone who has a worthiness, a significance, a meaningfulness to you, which I greatly appreciate. But in my usual world, when I'm on my local street going shopping or whatever, the way that I am seen, if I am seen at all, <laughs> is usually as this sad old git, you know, who uh, uh, look at his clothes, look at the clothes he wears, look at the way he walks. He, you know, uh, if I go to uh, my fishmonger or whatever, they usually give me a bit more because they feel sorry for me. <laughs> yeah? So space is not something, is not just something that I impose or experience or engage in in the world. It's what the world also imposes upon me and the way the world sees me and engages with me. So in some environments, we feel restricted. In some, we feel liberated. In some, we, we flinch from. Others, we revel in, whether it's closeness or distance, whether it's contact or lack of contact with other, whether our spatiality is our way of living in a relationally uncertain space. So let me give you another example from my work. So Russell comes to see me. Russell is a programmer and a technician, and he tells me that he's constantly or increasingly overwhelmed by what he calls anxiety. He tells me that he's finding himself easily distracted by sudden, painful, intrusive thoughts which he can't let go of. He finds himself either forgetting what he was about to do or typing in mistakes in the programs that he's, he's creating. And Russell also tells me that he's always prided himself on his technical and programming know-how, and now he feels that the respect he has earned from his colleagues is under threat. And he feels anxious about this. So Russell's life up until this point has been extremely ordered and precise. And when I ask him to tell me a bit more about what this order and precision expresses itself as, the first thing he talks about is physical space. The space in his, both his home office and his work office. And he describes both offices as being absolutely chock-a-block full with books, with journals, with design texts, with programming manuals, all of which are sorted out precisely so that he, and only he, knows exactly where to turn, where to find them. No one else can know exactly where 
things have been placed. Even more, he elaborates and says, well, I've got so many of these things, and they're all over the room, that I've had to construct a space, a little bit of space, for anybody who comes to walk through so that they can reach me. Uh, so it make, I've made it really difficult for people to get to me. So he's partly embarrassed by this, but he's also partly proud of this. You know, he, he, he's designed a path in which no one can speak to him unless he allows them to, unless he creates a means for them to approach him. He also adds that he keeps his rooms locked so that no one else could enter them. And even if this is provoking problems for the cleaning company that works in his offices, doesn't matter. The important thing is that Russell's sense of his space is protected and certain and his. Okay. Ernesto, we have 20 minutes. Okay. You told me to tell you. All right. So, as R.D. Lang reminds us, every problem is also an attempted solution. What is Russell attempting to solve through this space that he's enclosed? Exploring this, Russell eventually makes this statement. If I have this enclosed space, they can't get to me and they can't replace me. They can't get to me, they can't replace me. They being his company, but also members of his family with, with whom he's experiencing some difficulties. So I say to him, Russell, are you telling me and are you telling yourself that you, you use space, your use of space in creating barriers and obstacles is a way of making it more difficult for people to replace you? And Russell says, yeah, of course, yes. I hadn't thought of that, but yes. So in the course of our therapeutic sessions, Russell's awareness of this leads him to start making some changes. His relation to physical space changes so that he begins to feel a sense of dissatisfaction with the way he has lived with space up until now. So for instance, the color of his walls, the fit of his work chair, his inability to stretch out in the room, start to no longer suit him. And Russell's subsequent actions, which focus upon the opening up of physical space, are accompanied by a movement of greater openness towards others, whether his colleagues at work or his families at home. And though he values these ventures and judges them to be beneficial. Nonetheless, he recognizes how they have also provoked experiences of bewilderment for him and most of all, of uncertainty for him. In previous situations, the way he had lived with space had allowed Russell to shut out and thereby control the impact and presence of others. This new relationship with space forces him to inhabit a new space in which a good deal of that power had to be relinquished. He has moved from a position of certainty and security to one of ever open possibility 
and hence greater and greater uncertainties. Russell's rejection of space that he of the space that he'd previously constructed and his reshaping of a new one reflects his abandonment and restructuring of his previous chosen way of engaging with the world. And as well as in, in regaining human contact and relationship, Russell is also forced to embrace the ever increasing degree of risk and uncertainty. Kierkegaard put it like this, freedom's possibility announces itself in anxiety. Time and space open us to the possibilities and limitations that we impose upon freedom itself. Here and now, there and then, time and space, all our relations shaped by and through our openness and our resistance to what makes, to what these point us towards. If I can say very, very briefly before stopping, these experiences of time and space upon us as professionals have been, have been really challenged by, our, by the three years of COVID that we've lived through. We've had to reconsider how we as therapists work with time and space. Many of us found that working online through Zoom or whatever, that time was no longer the usual time that we kept when we were working with clients face to face, no longer suited. Maybe it was too long or too short. Maybe it had to be changed. Similarly with space, suddenly the space that we were in, the virtual space that we were in, shifted, altered. The client was not in our space, the client could see more of our space. Some of us hid it by you know, having images of beaches and so forth. But eventually, most people let go of that. They revealed their office wherever they were. Yeah? And that changed space. That changed the awareness of space. Some therapists decided that the only way that they could engage with space with their client in a non-virtual way was to meet them outdoors, to go walking with them, to go to parks or wherever and engage with them in that way. And some therapists, as my friend and colleague Greg Madison pointed out to me, started to use virtual reality machines with their clients. So they met in a in a seemingly three-dimensional virtual space, unfortunately having to look like avatars of one sort or another. <laughs> so, you know, the Sphinx meets the Shimmera and, and so forth. <laughs> yeah? Anyway, let me end with some, again, some beautiful words. This is again from T.S. Eliot, and it's again from The Four Quartets. You say that I am repeating something I have said before. I shall say it again. Shall I say it again? In order to arrive there, to arrive where you are, to get where you are not, you must go by a way wherein there is no ecstasy. In order to arrive at what you do not know, you must go by a way which is the way of ignorance. In order to possess what you do not possess, you must go by the way of dispossession. And in order to arrive at what you are not, you must go through the way in which 
you are not. And what you do not know is the only thing you know. And what you own is what you do not own. And where you are is where you are not. Thank you. So, thank you, dear Professor Spinelli. So, I think, is it okay? We have one or two questions, and I think Dr. Arek, yes. Um, do we have a microphone? Um, can we get a microphone, please? There. There, please. Okay. Is it okay, Ernesto? We have until 12. Okay. Uh, практику. So the question of Alexander Alexeychuk is uh, how is your uh, this changing in uh, modern technologies like smartphone and that's it uh, changed your uh, uh, connection with time and space we, yeah. you, how you uh, how I personally you, your, your, yes and in your uh, practice in your practice in my practice практически я сейчас хочу сказать раньше у меня в отделении 25 человек лечится в психотерапевтическом отделении сейчас когда я провожу группу вот я могу вызвать во время группы его родственников по телефону и поэтому значит у меня в отделении можно сказать не только сам один человек но вся его семья если надо. Mm -hmm. И вообще, может быть, не 25 человек, а 50. Mm -hmm. For example, Alexander Alexander said that uh, in his department he has, for example, 25 uh, patients, yes. But uh, due to smartphones, uh, he can, for example, talk not only with the patient, but also with his relatives. And it means that it could be not 25, but uh, 50 or more in like this process. И когда у меня индивидуальная терапия, значит, я сейчас же пациент сидит против меня, я могу вызвать у него, значит, тех людей, с которыми у него трудности. И поэтому моя работа сейчас за последних два года очень изменилась. Because yes. now in five minutes we are so okay. In, in it's very important. In yes. individual consultation also the same. If you are talking with uh, a person, uh, Alexander said yeah. he, he can also call or somehow with his relatives or friends or with somebody with he has a problem. Okay. Uh, I'd like to think that I'm not a technophobe uh, of any sort, but. I have uh, an extreme aversion to Mr. Zuckerberg and all that he stands for. So I avoid Facebook. I avoid anything that he has anything to do with um, because he strikes me as a, an unworthy person. So I don't employ myself uh, a number of uh, social media platforms that lots of people employ. But having said that, uh, I think I have tried to embrace a lot of the way my clients use the new technology um, and recognize that to them it matters a great deal. It changes their idea of time and space it opens up possibilities, but it also has increasingly powerful limitations that we are only beginning to become aware of. Uh, among them, I think, are limitations of 
what what can be expressed, how it can be expressed. Um, the notion of privacy is becoming increasingly problematic, intangible, uh, unavailable to people. Um, a lot of my clients during the first year of COVID were at initially very uneasy with the idea of working online, but then very quickly began to find that much to their surprise, they spoke more freely, more immediately about the problems and issues in their lives. They treated it almost like a confessional rather than a process of therapy, or maybe the two are the same in some ways. Uh, I'm finding it difficult to convince my clients to return back to face-to-face -to -face work because it's seemingly so convenient to them to stay where they are, to stay in their space. My sense is, is that therapy might be limited to some degree by that, unless we co-create a mutually new world space, therapy space, however virtual it might be. But, you know, these are, these are huge issues, and uh, this is a whole other conference, I think, that should address these questions. Do we have time for one more question? Is there anybody in the audience? Thank you for your question. Okay. No questions? Yes, yes uh, there. I have uh, one okay. question. First of all, thank you very much for this, uh, this beautiful uh, talk. I enjoyed it uh, thank you. very much. Um, my question is by, by noticing that uh, our clients have um, their way of uh, perceiving space and their way of perceiving um, time, their lived experience of it. Um, I feel that there is also like uh, a responsibility coming with it and, and a power to maybe change or influence uh, them in it. And my question is just like, how do you relate to this uh, kind of existential responsibility towards um, the freedom the clients have to maybe change their way of experiencing time and, uh, and space? Well, in some ways, it's uh, what I alluded to yesterday, for those of you who were here, is that one of, one of the things I try to remind myself, not just my people I work with as supervisees or trainees, is be very, very cautious about your desire to change or to promote change in the person. Um, change in any one aspect of our being alters the whole of our being, sometimes in very subtle ways, sometimes in very dramatic ways, always in unpredictable ways and uncertain ways. So I make it my task not to seek to direct any kind of change. I allow change. I allow. I don't allow it. Change happens. You know, it, uh, it can't stop that from happening. But how a client changes or what a client chooses as their moment of change, uh, that is always amazing, unpredictable, unknown, uncertain. Um, and so be it. Um, but I think to try to answer your question a, a little bit more, uh, what clients usually bring are the problematic side of their lives. And they present the problem, they present the issues that the problem is provoking for them and so forth. What they don't usually present or don't have not considered is what the problem is also giving them, what it is providing for them, um, what they would hate to lose if the problem went away 
and what they wanted or wanted to keep also went away. So the exploration is an act of looking at what does the problem take away from you, but also what does it allow for you? What does it give you? And would you miss what it gives you? Um, would the price you have to pay for keeping what is given to you that matters to you is the maintenance of the problem. And then, of course, if they accept that position, the magic is that their relation to the problem has shifted because now it's no longer some alien agency. It is something that they have chosen. It is something that maintains them as well as disturbs them. And so it's, it's their decision, in a way, to address that. So... <laughs>